Okay, I believe that we are successfully finally <laughs> on Facebook Live. Awesome. All right, so we're just going to jump right in. Um, I am Genevieve Anderson. I am the director of Dust One, a movie that I wrote and directed in Southern Arizona about immigration in the wall. And we are here uh, today with um, Reverend Matthew Funk Crary of the Univer Universalist, um, Borderlands Universalist Unitarian. That's a mouthful. Finally, um, <laughs> We're here. I'm so uh, happy, Reverend, to be with you today because this is our third time trying to get onto Facebook Live and the Zoom gods have not been smiling on us, but they are today. So um, yeah, we didn't break it again. Yeah. We didn't break it. We didn't break it. Um, but just to iterate again, the reason that we're doing this series of interviews called Talk About Immigration is to let um, bring what's happening on the ground in real time right now at the southern border to people who otherwise wouldn't know. So we're doing interviews with different voices from Im immigration ab advocacy community to bring again, bring awareness um, and also specifically to shed some light on the, the most important issues as we approach the upcoming election. Uh, you know, who, who is most at risk and who um, has um, sort of the most to, to gain or lose uh, given the outcome. So, um, I would love, first of all, just to start talking, for you to start talking about uh, who you are and what brought you back to Amato because you were gone for 20 years and then you came back. So sort yeah. of what your personal journey is and a little bit about your congregation. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to do this. Thank you for this series. Um, really amplifying what's happening here um, is so important. Um, and I know it comes from a place you've shared with me that you lived here for a time. Um, yeah. And I think that is equally as important. Um, for me, it starts with the land. Uh, I was born and raised in Tucson. Um, and so came to know um, the borderlands um, through that experience of uh, a child growing up here. Um, very grateful to my parents who early on um, at their church, uh, Christ Church United Methodist, just around the corner from where I live, um, taught me that faith was about service and service is always about relationship. Um, and the sacred relationship that they had and still have as uh, they're still active members there as one can be today. Um, you know, their faith was um, in a Christian tradition and early on um, it didn't speak to me the same way. And I could recognize that and I could recognize that um, their faith was something very much alive uh, in their lives. And it wasn't a language that uh, had the same meaning for me. Hmm. And so um, I spent many years exploring, uh, testing out other faiths, uh, you know, sleeping over at a friend's house and going to church the next morning and joining it. Um, I mean, I was, I was a desperate seeker in many ways uh, for the language and the relationship. Um, and it wasn't until uh, I was I had moved away. I'd gone to college uh, in St. Paul, um, and um, that I heard of a faith that began to speak the same language um, that I was seeking, and that was Unitarian Universalism. Wow. Um, and so, um, through a call process and all kinds of fun things, over a period of twenty years, became a UU minister, um, seminary in Massachusetts. Uh, coming back to this region uh, through California, having a ministry in Riverside, California for 10 years, and then feeling called back to uh, to the borderlands, to Sonoran Desert. Um, and coming back at this point then with uh, my wife, my partner, and our five sons. Wow. Um, and lots of chickens and dogs and pets and all kinds of fun stuff like that too. Can you um, help us understand what the dis this distinction of um, Unitarian Universalism, what, what does that mean? What makes you distinct? Sure, uh, so one of, I'd say the clearest thing is that we are a covenantal faith. Um, and that means that we have developed agreements um, with each other about how we're going to um, journey together in this life. Um, there is no doctrine, there is no creed something you have to join in a relationship about how you live um, mm -hmm. and in fact one of my my good friends and colleagues uh, Reverend Rod Richards says that what you believe is so important to us we won't dictate it to you <laughs> uh, 
And that means on a given Sunday um, in my congregation, Borderlands, uh, UU there in Amada, um, when we were able to get together in person, we had the experience of people being there who certainly Christianity spoke to them. Uh, but we also had people sitting next to them um, that had no faith, that were atheists, um, Taoists, Buddhists. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And what helped us in that diverse theological setting was to agree um, to covenant, how we are going to be and journey with one another. Um, and so that becomes uh, the challenge and the support to our communities. Each community, each UU community has its own covenant uh, made up by the people and um, incorporating the people that are there. Wow, that's fast. It's amazing. Um, and I, I still marvel that I didn't find you while I was in, um, while I was in Tubac because I was ac actively searching for a congregation. And I, you know, as I mentioned, I'm an, I, I have a, you know, go to Agape for a long time and was live streaming, but I, anyway, it's interesting that I found you after, after leaving. So, yes, right. but anyway, um, I want to talk a little bit about the borders community, the border community's unity statement, mm -hmm. which is really powerful. And it was written in 2018. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And, and 2018, I was there in 2018 and 2018 was when there was a, a huge deployment of, uh, m military. Yeah flooding the border in anticipation of all of the, um, the, 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 you know, the throngs of uh, asylum seekers that they were anticipating were gonna literally, literally storm the border and, and climb the wall. And so they came yeah. and put up all of that concertina wire. That's and I that. remember the feeling of it at that, at that time. And I wanted you to talk a little bit more about it and share that your, uh, the, just the bas basic tenets of this statement, which we can actually put in the chat, there were three demands. One was a call for an immediate cancellation of military deployment on the southern border. Uh, second was a demand full protection for the human rights of asylum seekers um, presenting themselves at the U.S. border. And third and finally calling for a full-scale demilitarization of the U.S.-Mexico border. Yeah. So however you want to take it, um, the genesis sure. of that sort of what's happening now, because I think what's happening now too is also really important for us to understand. Yeah. I had the same experience you did, uh, and that was really witnessing um, National Guard uh, vehicles, personnel coming, um, and um, at a, a wall that already existed, uh, particularly in Nogales, uh, Arizona, uh, adding car this concertina wire, this razor wire, uh, in mass amounts and just covering it. Um, the feeling and the experience of that. Um, it was very challenging because, you know, um, this is my country, you know, this is, uh, I'm a US citizen. And to see that this was going on um, under US policy was extraordinarily challenging to me and to the people at the congregation. Um, so it was an easy step for us to certainly agree and sign on to uh, that statement. Um, the other thing that really, I think occurred for us um, at that moment was an awakening to our interconnections with other groups in the area. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly many groups have done direct humanitarian aid for much longer than, you know, that 2018 period. Um, and they had a lot of um, education that they were willing to offer. And it was hard to see. It was hard to understand that U.S. policy was behind a lot of the migration that was going on out of countries out of Central and uh, America. Um, and that also what U.S. policy was doing was forcing people into more and more deadlier parts of our desert, um, that it was actually explicit policy. That was very hard to hear until we started to experience things in a, in a radically different way. We started to see um, the policies of our, con of our entire country um, being carried out through concertina wire, unnecessary at risks. Um, unnecessary personnel, um, tactics. Uh, we witnessed uh, there in Sonora, uh, Nogala, uh, I'm sorry, just north of the border on our side. We, we witnessed um, tactics, uh, training tactics to fight against uh, crowds, hordes of people coming. Certainly uh, my congregation and, and the congregation around us and, and in our own lives do experience border crossers. Um, 
And border crossers are just a part of the life that we have and providing to see though that there was this fear of masses and hordes and tactics for fighting um, crowds, those kinds of things being carried out was very challenging. Um, and it allowed us to, I think, to awaken to some of those deeper truths um, and to begin to see that the border has been militarized for a long time. The technology, in my understanding, a lot of it comes out of uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, it's um, detecting and tracking human beings uh, along borders that uh, governments don't wish for human beings to cross. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we, we also knew uh, as we began to open ourselves to the education was that this migration had been encouraged by the US government um, decades before. One of my colleagues here in Amato recalls a time when he was young. Um, he lived in uh, Nogales, Arizona, and his mom said, go get some bread. He gave him some change, and he ran across the border, bought some bread in Sonora, Mexico, ran across the border, and brought bread home. It used to be a fluid place. Right. And so we began through the experience uh, of that buildup in 2018 to really uh, allow the education that had already been available um, to really start to seep in. Um, uh, the realities of um, of the border and living in the borderlands. At that point, we weren't called Borderlands UU. Um, at that moment, we had a different name and an identity. Um, we had planned to do a name change and ended up with um, Borderlands Unitarian Universalist. Um, and it was a name that surprised us. Um, certainly it had geopolitical mm -hmm. influence, but more than that, We uh, see the border as a line. We see the border as uh, that has certainly two designated sides that together are whole. Mm -hmm. And that wholeness in our own selves and the wholeness of our um, Southern Arizona and Sonora, Mexico communities. Mm -hmm. That's what we started to begin to understand was a part of us and a part of what we wanted to seek to be a, to um, strengthen. So one of the things that was um, most alarming about this display of force with the concertina wire was how incongruous that it was with the, the, the supposed threat. And we realized that it was a big, it was a big display. It was a show for the rest of the world um, that uh, it was theater. Basically, there was a there was a threat coming and we, we needed to be scared and it called for these extreme measures when anyone living in the area at the time was like, this is so strange. There's a sense that there, there is a piece there that no people who don't live in that area don't understand because they just think about it being at this contentious area with people crossing and stealing and, and drugs. And, and certainly mm -hmm. there, there's some of that going on, but it's not the norm. Um, and certainly there weren't throngs of, there are people, there are asylum seekers who need help, but they weren't violent or aggressive. Or there's not, none of that ever happened. So, um, and it's interesting though, we, we get a sense in a way that that's died down a little bit, but the, but the actions at uh, bird camp that happened, whatever, a, a couple of months ago, and you say again, last night, this sort of overdetermined uh, military yeah. aggression coming to this place where Asylum seekers are sorry, undocumented migrants are known to stop for assistance. So, what is happening in the moment? What is the snapshot of right now? Uh, what's going on there? And maybe um, in that, you could talk a little bit about the resist the wall action that happened sure. in South City. Yeah. I'm having a bit of a lag. Um, How's now? Um, let's see, I think a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. 
So what's happening here um, is connected to what's happening in other major cities. Um, the same group, Homeland Security, and and what has happened at bird camp um, this summer and then just last night was uh, a buildup of uh, border patrol um, vehicles um, when i was there and witnessed what i saw over the summer prior just prior to that raid that day was a uh, heavy armored vehicle uh, clearly didn't belong in the area um, had several TVs, um, over 20, um, am I glitching still? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. It seems to go, to go slow and then if I need to go back. Okay. Yeah. I got that, the, the armored vehicle and the ATVs. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, on one hand, it results in the arrest and deportation of border crossers. Yes, they're receiving humanitarian aid at bird camp. Uh, again, not a crime to offer that. Um, but more than that, it's a tactic uh, very much like what you witnessed um, when you were here in 2018. It's theater, except that it's involving human lives now. Mm -hmm. um, and really is to intimidate who are operating. Uh, I mean, it really is what it's doing now to um, not succumb to that. Um, and so we do a lot of feeling the fear. We, my congregation and I, we try to embody it. Where is it that we've experienced that fear? I, I tend to feel it in my calves. <laughs> um, and to um, acknowledge it as part of a lamentation. Um, this is happening. It is real. Um, it is a threat. And from that, not just react, but respond. How do we want to respond? And we want to respond from the wholeness of our hearts. Mm -hmm. That fear um, is just one side of a border and the other side would be trust. So how do we build trust? Um, and um, that takes me sometimes to Ajo um, and meet with the Ajo Samaritans, sometimes to Aravaca to meet with uh, people helping people. Um, and sometimes to bird camp at the request of no more deaths, um, I show up and uh, try to be a part of that trust so that I then act from the wholeness and not just the fear. Because um, the fear is real and we wanna, we, we hold it as real. It's part of a reality of where we're living, um, but we're not going to respond from it. And that to me puts wholeness back into the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is a, a process of that. And um, then I get to be a part of that, embody that uh, with others. Right, I, I, it makes a lot of sense to me. I wanna unpack fear because the, the, the purported reason for the Border Patrol to be there is to protect us, right? To keep undocumented, you know, illegal people um, from coming into the United States. Right, so they're there to protect us. Why are we afraid? What is the fear about when you see these these this this presence yeah. in these big vehicles? You know what what what's in there? I tra I trace the fear back to um, 9/11 myself and mm -hmm. the experience that we had then, and how we uh, as an American people allow. does, uh, the effect it, what that does is from every border in the United States, uh, five to 100 miles, uh, citizens don't have rights. Hmm. 
Um, I'm getting my unstable, uh, and I'll slow down a bit. Uh, okay. Unstable connection. What that means for a motto, which is uh, right there, um, is that we don't have the same rights we would um, enjoy, say, in the center, the heartland mm -hmm. of the United States. Um, and that uh, giving that away, giving away our rights was a part of being afraid. Um, I think it was that reaction. The United States realized it was much more a part of the world and could be injured by terrorist acts, mm. could be hurt, wounded. And instead of responding to it from our wholeness, we responded to it with fear. Um, so when actions like resist the wall, strengthen the spirit, come along, and that was something that occurred uh, a couple of weeks ago, Aravaka uh, organizers in relationship with um, the Otham people, um, in indigenous peoples of different groups here, um, with their their gratitude, organized a week long interfaith um, gathering at the wall called Resist the Wall, Strengthen the Spirit. Um, and that was an opportunity uh, for different faiths to come. Um, and Quakers and Catholics and Buddhists and Unitarian Universalists uh, came with our traditions to um, stand in the shadow of the wall, to resist it, uh, to bring um, the struggle in our hearts to be whole and to not act from fear and the struggle um, that the wall itself represents. Mm -hmm. And so I brought a network of individuals, my colleagues here um, in Southern Arizona, and then people who couldn't travel, who would have come um, because of uh, COVID, uh, but would have been here. Um, we recorded their voices and created transcripts and we shared, uh, we shared all kinds of wonderful, um, their, their words. And we're able to edit that and put them back in with their ghosts. A network. It takes a broad network of people and connections for us to find the resistance and to strengthen one another. Yeah. And, and in a way, then, what you're talking about is uh, not <clears throat> kind of like an energy healing in a way. It's a belief that through showing up and through this, this, open-hearted connection with others and an open-hearted sort of commitment to the space, to the natural environment, that a shift is occurring, right? That this is a different, different way to respond to something that feels, that, that is literally enormous. I mean, this new, improved, beautiful wall that, that is being built right now, right? Is very, it's very real. It's a very, very real material presence. And so to, to counter that with a, a spiritual intent I think is really interesting. Um, yeah. And so, um, yeah, there was a sense, um, there was a sense of um, belonging mm -hmm. that um, I think is something that has always been a part of the Sonoran Desert for me. Um, I think the, de the desert here uh, invites a relationship. Um, and it's a challenging one because mm -hmm. it gets hot and it gets dangerous. Uh, and there are lots of cactus and lots of critters uh, that know how to protect themselves. And yet it's a relationship of reciprocation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, water itself is uh, something that we rely on here and it has to be a language of reciprocation. Mm -hmm. um, and that teaches, it has taught me and it and continues to teach me. Um, and so when I was there at the wall, um, it was clear to me the wall did not belong. Hmm. The wall was not part of the relationships, and, but the people were. The invitation to come by organizers, the gratitude of the awesome people, um, the 30 or so people who joined us 
during our Unitarian Universalist morning there. Um, there was a sense of belonging. There was a uh, be, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh says to be is to inter be. Um, and so there was a sense of being awakening to our relationships to the land, to the earth, to the people there. Um, and then the longing, the yearning that I believe we deeply have yeah. to deepen that relationship. Absolutely. Um, I wanna circle back to this word lamentation because yeah. I'm really drawn to that word. I want you to talk a little bit about, a little bit more about what that means. Yeah, um, it's something that uh, is not very strong in my observation of my own faith tradition. Um, covenant tends to be aspirational in many ways to sort of say, this is where we're headed. Mm -hmm. um, and lamentation takes into account where you are. Mm. And um, one of my teachers, Joanna Macy, um, says, begin in gratitude, be grateful for what you have, but then honor the pain. Mm. And we, uh, we, we're grateful because we need to lean into that when we're honoring pain, but to honor it, to experience it, um, to feel it is a very different thing than an aspiration which points us beyond. Hmm. Um, and it's deeply uncomfortable, uh, lamentations are, um, to be able to hold and then to feel, uh, locate in your body where your grief is or your anger or your fear. Um, but what Joanna teaches is that when we do that and then when we share it, when we express that to one another, we begin to find the fear is, uh, and expressing it is a means to trust. We begin to feel that rage is the acknowledgement of the injustice and a cry for justice. And we begin to understand that our grief is really, it's the source of our love, it really has the same place. And there again is that wholeness, right. the two sides, and yet they need one another. Um, mm -hmm. So we feel, we react to the world, to the wall, with fear and anger and grief. And then when we lament together, we can begin to respond from a wholeness mm. that is our love and justice and trust. Um, oh. And that establishes it again in the world. And I do believe it's healing um, in, for individuals and ultimately healing for all of our relationships, mm. uh, including our, our relationship with the earth, with the Sonoran Desert. It's beautiful. It is, it's wildly uncomfortable. I mean, mm. when, you, when in a normal environment, we're brought to, and it, you know, we rely on our own personal experience, I suppose, the, the highs and lows of our own personal experience to have a feeling of lamentation, to embrace pain. And now it's, it's universal. There's such a tremendous unrelenting pressure and difficulty with no, uh, <laughs> Uh, there's no obvious hope. There's no like, oh, it's only going to last this long. Or we, we don't, we don't know, you know, what what the what the fallout of all of these things is go is going to be in the future. So I'm curious how you take all of these feelings, um, this lamentation, the, the present moment, and all of its jagged realities, and then yeah. how you feed that through your ministry mm -hmm. to help your congregation um, focus on a tomorrow that is at all promising. Well, I have heard uh, that, you know, the year 2020 has this curse and there's all these terrible things happening. Um, I, I know, at least in my own sphere of relationships of two babies being born. So one of the things about belonging, the being and the acknowledging our relationships, yeah, we honor the pain, but we have to understand there are joyful things happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I can laugh at the curse of 2020, but I, I don't try to promote. That's all the beautiful things still. And um, again, there um, to not simply react from the worst, 
Mm -hmm. um, it is more about today. I feel like more and more we are being asked to um, by the world and what is happening, both the pain and the joy, mm -hmm. to be more present to now um, and to be comfortable with uncertainty. Um, it's, it is one of those challenges that I find um, support through relationship for. Right. me that being present, though it may be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. can be enough. Um, uh, I've long taught about um, tomorrow. If I have with my ancestors, those people who have made me and this moment possible, is the same relationship I have with all of those who are coming after mm. um, to share the future generations. Um, and those who have come before me that I shared their genes, um, those people have struggled and made it through hardships. So there's something of an assurance that I can. Um, and then there is that responsibility in the relationship with those who come after. Uh, that I need to be a good ancestor as well. Wow. Uh, to, to struggle and survive and thrive uh, through this time. That's a beautiful way to put it, thinking of yourself as, a, as an ancestor. You know? <laughs> and... There are many teachers that, I, and I'm not citing I, I, off the top of my head who, who gives me that, but many teachers, a lot of uh, people are teaching this today. I'm just a beautiful. I would, wanted you to back that thought up if you could, because you cut out and I wanted to hear it. Okay. Yeah. It's just that I, I do want to recognize and share my gratitude for all the things that I am sharing things I've learned from them but I may not be citing them individually. Um, and um, mostly today uh, for me, it's uh, people of color um, that um, the reality for generations, uh, hundreds of years in the United States for them uh, has been one of struggle um, and are now offering the wisdom, not just to survive, but to thrive today. Yeah. Um, I take a great, of learning from them. Um, if we could leap off of that thought into one of your initiatives in the church, the Voices for the Voiceless, which you started in 2016, so well before, yeah. you know, the George Floyd murder and our nation's yeah. long overdue reckoning with racial injustice. So um, yeah. I'd love to know a little bit more that in, about that initiative, but also what you think it is about this particular moment that has allowed that reckoning to finally occur. And, and what do we do with it? Where, where, how are we called to take that forward into a future that is, that is changed for people of color? Yeah, the Voices for the Voiceless um, was an initiative for the congregation simply to be to acknowledge our interrelationship and to yearn for more, hmm. um, to recognize there were voices we weren't hearing um, and to try to use our voice, whether that was our website or email or on a Sunday morning um, to invite more, to hmm. acknowledge and invite more. Um, I think that what we're seeing today in a social uprising that is calling us um, as American citizens to recognize the racial inequalities, um, you know, it's so much faith um, that have occurred. Um, it's not a new thing. But there is something very different in this moment, um, 
I feel. Um, and I don't know quite what that is. Um, maybe it is the recognition of um, lamentation mm. as, uh, as people like myself who are white recognize um, the struggle uh, that we have within our own country and policies uh, that we thought maybe upheld um, justice, rather upheld uh, white supremacy or upheld a uh, caste system or upheld um, other justices, particularly uh, against people of color, so against women, um, against anyone who didn't fit a particular uh, structure. I think in some ways we're recognizing that the way that our, our society is established isn't broken. It's functioning just as it's supposed to. Hmm. It's meant to break people. Um, hmm. And that's a, a terrible awakening um, to recognize that uh, I have a privilege uh, based on a system um, and it's not just being white, but it's being male and able-bodied and of a certain age and education and, um, all of that, for me, a sense of is normal, um, and it tends to protect me and give me rights above others, um, right. and and it breaks those other people because of that. So my personal calling would be uh, to be more deeply in that relationship, to yearn for more, and yearn for more, even as it's uncomfortable to learn, um, and as a congregation, then. Um, it's exploring the relationships that we have. Um, we have not put up a Black Lives Matter banner. Um, and we haven't done that because that's not something that uh, is, isn't, we don't value, but rather um, it would make more sense where we're located to put up a brown line. And yet that would be using bridge to take someone else's message and adapt it to what we think is right. Hmm. Um, we have say that doesn't mean, mean that we haven't engaged in anti-racism uh, and anti-oppression work to explore our own hearts, mm -hmm. our own systems, um, and how it is we can put wholeness back into the world, a wholeness that's more just um, and more equitable. Um. And the, the whole, the idea of wholeness, I love this because wholeness in, in, in involves all of us, right? This, <laughs> it involves everybody. Like there's nobody that is left out, even the people we consider the most deplorable, right? They're all part of the yeah. human sort of spiritual body. So, um, and yet we're in a time where we've never been more divided and it's, one of the hardest things for me to reconcile has been, um, the, I don't know, the, the, this, this chasm, I'm gonna refer to what you call this, this gap, right? Between the absolute and total negation that there's even an issue. There's not even an acknowledgement that like racism is a construct that is used by deep state to keep people oppressed. And there's no such thing as that. Um, absolute negation of the other, you know, a, set against, you know, people like yourself who are striving for wholeness and equality. And how are we born so different? I don't, I don't know how to make sense of that. So um, writing on the side of love, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. And this, what you have on your website about it, our faith tradition calls us to stand in the gap between the affliction in our world and the world as it can be healed and whole. We are called to struggle to make the latter a reality. So it feels like this is what we're talking about, right? This gap where there's just this seemingly impossible divide and, and how against all of the, the, the pressure and the momentum of all of this anger and hatred, you are pushing forward this message of wholeness through your congregation and into the world. I suppose just speak a little bit more about that initiative and sort of what you think, how can we all participate in that? Sure. I, at first, I don't know that I would say we're a born um, with anything but maybe the capacity both to fear and to trust. Um, 
I think our society does a really wonderful job at keeping the fear uh, going, at investing a great deal in our fears. And one of the acts many have uh, or to experience a sense of oblivion. If I feel this, I will be destroyed by it. Hmm. Um, and that isn't true uh, outside of a person's heart. That can really hold a person back. It's that uh, Winston Churchill, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Bombs were dropping. Invasion was happening. A war was on. They had a lot more to fear than fear itself. But if they were to reside in the fear, if they were not to engage, they were going to make mistakes. They were not going to respond with trust. Uh, they were not going to respond except out of their fears. I think that's a very powerful thing in the world today, in our world. Um, I think fear controls us. Um, that said, excuse someone from being afraid. Um, I would want to assist them in moving out of fear. Um, it keeps us in the lower part of our brain, the reptilian part, mm -hmm. and move more into the mammalian part of our brains that are about relationships. And when we're kept here, we fight or we, fly, we flee or we freeze. Mm -hmm. But up here, we're in relationship. And that's when we begin to, to have reason. That's where we begin to think through things. Hmm. And hmm. Um, so our fears are real, right? But this higher level thinking comes out of our relationships with each other. It comes out of the sense of what wholeness could be, rather than just reacting out of my fear. Um, that, to me, is what humanity is about. That's that's the beauty of of our species, um, and it's a piece that's missing. And so. Um, divisions and walls and borders, um, they suggest that we're not whole and they invite the fears that keep us in a sense of maybe we'll, maybe we'll disappear if we feel this. Maybe if I go there and I'm so uncomfortable, I'll die. And our ancestors have proven us wrong, but we have to recognize our relationship with them, the strength that they have brought and all the struggles and fears that they have lived through. And of course, the same relationship with those who come after us. Um, we can be good ancestors to them if we engage in our fears and the struggle. Um, so any of the actions then that my congregation takes part in, if we position ourselves in that divide, in the gap, at the border, on the wall, it's a challenge for us to see ourselves mm. um, whole and in those deep relationships. Um, we certainly, I can, I have, and I will again react out of fear mm -hmm. uh, rather than respond out of my wholeness. But I have such wonderful colleagues uh, in what we call the Baja Four, the four uh, congregations, and in initiatives uh, that my congregation have started, uh, something called the Accompaniment Project. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Yeah, um, I mean, several of these things that you're you're sharing that we've done in the past really have come um, full circle with the accompaniment project. And we realized a number of uh, months ago before the pandemic that we weren't using our building uh, there in Amato um, as well as we could. We could offer it to others. And so we reached out to uh, five direct humanitarian aid groups in our area. Um, the three Samaritan groups in Ajo, Tucson, and the Green Valley Sarita Samaritans that we share. Ravaka. Great deal of work and is a ministry of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson. And we offered them our space 
for free. And we call it the accompaniment project because we didn't, it was a new relationship and we wanted them to, to imagine what we could do together utilizing this space. Um, we had a variety of plans and different needs from each group. And of course the pandemic changed a lot, uh, yeah. but one of the needs that PHP and No More Debts expressed was a need to, for a place to do laundry. Huh. Um, and just this last week through fundraising and project design and hard work by Borderlands people, we completed installing a washer and a dryer uh, at our church for the use of humanitarian aid groups. Um, Cause there's lots and lots of laundry that's necessary uh, to be good hosts uh, at some of the different facilities, um, both for uh, border crossers and of course for the volunteers. Um, the accompaniment project then is a relationship with these different groups that takes us where they need to go. And the name of it comes from what border crossers often call um, humanitarian aid workers, compañeros, yes. companions. And so what we have learned uh, as we have companion people that have come to our church, is we go where they go. They're, everyone's needs are different. We can't assume um, anything. And so we need to have water ready, food ready, socks ready. Um, but we then listen to what the needs are of those particular individuals in offering them humanitarian aid. Um, we've just learned over time that accompaniment is a journey. You walk alongside uh, people and it takes you to unique places. And that's what we're doing with these groups. Um, so that's an initiative we've, uh, we started in 2020. Uh, it's definitely taken a different direction with the pandemic. Right. Um, we have some parts of the projects, uh, the needs of organizations that are on hold and others we're looking to develop. Uh, as I mentioned, I was in Ajo uh, with the Ajo Samaritans. They very much would like to start an active ministry uh, with Borderlands UU. Um, and so we're looking at what that would mean. Uh, how can we support them and how can they support us? And that trip was, um, it, it offered me the opportunity to go out and do a water drop with the Samaritans to take a few gallons of water and some food to where they know people um, pass through and to leave that so that they can survive uh, in their crossing. Um, and I, there I was again, back in the desert, uh, 108 degrees. Oh, wow. Three hours beyond what we thought the trip would take. Um, that was just the hiking part. It was a five hour hike. Um, and yet I felt very much that call of belonging mm -hmm. to be aware of my relationship with the desert, with the small group I was with, with the border crossers whom I would never know. Yeah. Um, and with this larger system of injustice that my country is perpetuating, um, is being aggressive about today, um, and as we both recognized last night, decided that that would be, uh, take the form of raiding uh, bird camp, a place where humanitarian aid is offered to border crossers. Um, it's, it's hard in this moment. Um, it's challenging to not be angry, mm -hmm. um, to be enraged at the injustice of it. But um, I, I'm, I do believe in internal moments. I don't know, maybe you've had the experience where um, you can go back to a time and a place and you're equally as there in that moment as you are now in the present. Um, and being uh, standing in the desert um, on a border uh, crosser trail, a trail known uh, about 300 people a year use it uh, and putting down water, um, that I could carry in order that one person for one day would have a better chance at living. Hmm. And that too, that is a, a way for me to hold this rage uh, at what has happened um, and to hold my grief and my fear um, 
and in relationship um, respond with my wholeness and um, hopefully bring more of that wholeness into our world. It's very powerful. I mean, I, I, I res I'm responding a lot to um, this idea of of uh, thinking out of relationship because once we are in relationship, we're accountable. And if we understood more um, more intently, sort of what what people are going through right now, you know, we might feel more accountability to changing policy so that they can get processed at the border. We often think of either or. So if we are yeah. for same immigration policy, we must be for, you know, open borders and you know, and, <laughs> you know, yeah. all all of the things that actually we've had forever that 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 at different points in time have worked well when rational sane policy is at play. You still have, you know, ports of entry. Just like I have a fence around my house, I let people in who I want to let in. There there are systems in play that don't depend upon cruelty and they don't depend upon negation. And we're experiencing a time where we are constructing narratives that uh, negate and deny the validity of another human being. And that that is, yeah. yeah and, and of our own, yeah, it denies our own humanity. Yeah. As we deny theirs, it denies ours. But if we're open to a sense of belonging and interdependence, I need people, they need me, even if I never see them. If, if they're border crossers that I'm just leaving water for, there's an interdependence there. In that sense of belonging, everyone is welcome and can belong. And that doesn't mean you create policies that way, but you create it out of our humanity. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the critical thing, is the way that we are choosing to behave given um, given the crises that are going on now. I mean, globally, people migrating, people, refugees and asylum seekers, I mean, it's not going away. So either we're gonna build really big walls and become over militarized to protect our little spaces or we're gonna learn how to deal with this crisis. Um, and I love, again, I love what you're talking about the fear and acknowledging the fear and sort of standing in the fear and understanding this is part, like this moment is part of, of all of time, of the past and the mm -hmm. present and the future. And we're standing mm -hmm. in, a, in a really, really big moment and we're called to be uh, a, higher, a higher way than we've been in the past. We're called to inhabit and embody a strength and a courage and a wholeness that I think we haven't had to, we haven't had to do so far, um, right? No. I think you're very right there. I think that's part of the challenge is that we are uncovering a lot of the flaws and a lot of the false notions that we have been safe. Yeah. And what we're calling to called on today is to be brave. And to be brave, you have to acknowledge that there is danger. Um, yeah. You have to acknowledge that there are realities in this world that we used to lie to ourselves about. Um, but then to react simply out of fear um, is to be controlled by it. Right. And so uh, my faith uh, and my people at Borderlands, they call me to, to respond at wholeness. Um, and that just makes more relationships and it makes this call possible. Right. Uh, it makes, you know, and wherever this begins to share, uh, you know, and spread um, and offer more information, but also the relationships. I love that. That's my big takeaway. I, I really, um, I mean, I think about that, you know, all day long in, in different ways. So sometimes just language, there are all these little keys in the use of language and words, which I love. There's these portals into uh, deeper ways of thinking about things. So thank yeah. you for that. Um, and I know we're coming up on an hour. I want to um, let everybody know that we're going to put the link um, to the accompaniment project in the a little Thank space you. underneath. Yeah, so that people, because this is an active, ongoing thing, it's a yeah. way for people to get involved. And also th the link to Borderlands um, Unitarian yeah. Universalist, so that people can check out. Um, your wonderful congregation. There's actually a bunch of stuff that we didn't even talk about that's on the site that I think is really enlivening and interesting. And, and I'm definitely gonna come 
uh, next time. Well, when you're when you're meeting again, and when I'm in Southern Arizona, hopefully that will be soon. So, is there anything else that you wanted to share or say before we wrap wrap up this interview? Just my gratitude again. Um, again, my teachers uh, always um, begin and end this way, and so they've taught me to do the same. Really, really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, not just to talk through this medium to lots of people that, but to talk with you about it. Uh, we have uh, had a little journey to get to this moment. Yes. <laughs> um, but no, I've really appreciated that. Um, a, a bit of time, um, a little bit of struggle, a, a reminder of what's important uh, within that. Um, I really appreciated that time with you. And I do look forward to meeting you in person someday yes, uh, like when it is uh, socially distanced appropriate and all those wonderful things. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much. And I also wanted to mention to people, anybody who's interested in using um, Dust One, um, my film as part of a, um, a gathering um, for uh, online screenings with Q&A with uh, the cast and crew or fundraisers, just um, message us on the Facebook site and let us know. Uh, we'll be in Cincinnati week after next at the Esquire Theater uh, showing the film to a live audience, which will be interesting. So anyway. Until we meet again, Matthew, thank you so much. All right, so long. <laughs>